Hello everyone. Uh, <coughs> there are a lot of places here. If you want to come closer to John, if, uh, if you want to escape soon, then stay where you are. And uh, well, we have today John, uh, John Lot, uh, Jonathan Lot. Uh, I think that he doesn't need uh, a lot of presentations in this school because he's now being coordinating the third and it's, this is the third year you are coming to teach a third option student. This year he has the responsibility of coordinating which is always horrible and he's living with this. But uh, as, as many of you know, uh, he is the principal of, of PARA project and also co-founder of the collective LOC with William O'Brien and Michael Kubo uh, that are in this city. Um, he is the recipient of the Design Vanguard uh, Award by Architectural Record, the New Practices New York Award by the American Institute of Architects, the Architectural League Prize by the Architectural League of New York, a MoMA PS1 Young Architect finalist, and has taught at Syracuse, like the School of Architectures New York City, New York City program. So he has all the pedigree that is needed for a New York based architect. And thanks God, he is now with us and escaping from New York. So let, let's see what he presents to us. Thank you, Anyaki, and thank you for inviting me to uh, talk about my work in this series. Uh, can everyone hear me fine? Is it okay? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm going to go through um, uh, a number of projects quickly, uh, four projects which are uh, in my, of my own practice, uh, solo work, if you will, uh, but with the team, of course, and then four projects with um, the collective that I work, um, Anyaki mentioned, Collective LOK, with uh, William O'Brien Jr. and Michael Kubo. Uh, I titled the talk Holes in Clockwork uh, for two reasons. One, because I'm interested in how to frame the projects as holes, uh, but also because I feel that uh, holes are where we find opportunity, uh, gaps within the profession. I uh, ran a conference uh, called Loopholes as a student here at the GSD, uh, which was really about finding the space within the discipline to practice. Um, the second, uh, clockwork, is, is about the, the regular part of the profession that keeps things ticking, uh, always moving, the, the part that you can count on, but that uh, you're always fighting against a bit. Um, I think the subtitle for this talk would be uh, Headspace. This is Headspace, uh, a bust that I made for a show that, uh, that Liam curated in LA. Actually, John had a, had a bust in that show as well, where 11 architects were asked to create uh, a version of the bust in architectural terms. So it was very limited to the space of the pedestal, but rather than create an object um, which the, the bust and sculpture typically does, I wanted to create a space for the, for the face. Uh, here's Florian's face in my, my space. Um, and he had, he had a bust in the show as well. Um, but I won't, I won't go into detail about this, but it was um, a very personal uh, exploration about how to concern uh, oneself with the space of architecture rather than the face. Uh, one of the first projects uh, before we get to the holes that I did was through invitation uh, to submit for 306090, which is a publication, I don't know if it's still running, uh, by Jonathan Solomon and Emily Abruzzo. Uh, they ran uh, one of the issues on the topic of decoration. So of course I went to Mies and asked what if Mies uh, were to receive a facelift? Uh, how would, in particular, the Seagram building, rather than Mies's face, um, how could it be updated um, rather than in the sort of the mullions, the iconic eye beam as mullion, uh, in a Fordist, uh, with a Fordist agenda, be updated um, as per current technology with a post-Fordist uh, mentality. And it was uh, about a kind of post-Fordist nip and tuck that actually rather than a solution um, and a proposal was more a critique in some way and a question about why we manipulate because we can, simply because we can. Uh, and I felt like at the time there was an abuse of the tool on digital fabrication to the point where it was uh, absurd and excessive uh, architecturally um, operating because you can. 
uh, this image from Moulin Rouge uh, using Fat Boy Slim's uh, song, Because We Can. <laughs> And more interested rather in the surgical procedure of a post fortis mentality on the face. And more so, I feel like entering, this, this slide is important for two reasons for me, entering the discipline at a moment of the aftermath of the, of the um, uh, excessive, the culture of excess in digital fabrication, the time of the crash, and wondering how we'll heal from this in one, in one sense, but also um, how the, the bandage or the mask operates to concern oneself with what's behind it and the space, again, rather than the face itself uh, or the whole um, rather than the object. And to, and to enter as a practitioner questioning the discipline as to what, what the motives are for uh, using these tools if we are to use them um, effectively. In one last sort of uh, setup for the, for the talk, I became interested in, in how the Rorschach was uh, both familiar and unfamiliar, and how the references uh, loosely embedded in something like the Rorschach could lead to ambiguity um, and intrigue and a manipulation of typology. So here is a few tests of, of Rorschachs made up of architectural, uh, architectural icons. <laughs> installation at the Architectural League of New York. So the first hole. So I'll talk about four projects as holes. All of these are in Syracuse, New York over the period of about four years. All of them built uh, and then go into the clockwork portion of the talk. The first hole was for uh, an attic conversion to a writing space for a couple. One was a writer and they both own a, a letterpress. Uh, the, the problem with the, or the, the issue here was really uh, I'm not, I'm not dealing with the exterior, so it was perfect to operate uh, uh, on the terms of a hole. But the issue of headspace uh, along the spine, actually let me do this, uh, the spine of the project was very tight, so that only six feet wide uh, you could uh, act, uh, physically stand. And so it was about clearing this, uh, this space here and providing circulation as a spine with seated program uh, within the aisles or the nooks. So it's a study model about uh, how to get these niches and nooks to behave according to the spine. Uh, the existing stair to the attic was a problem because it entered mid-space. <coughs> so we looked at ways to manage it, ultimately push the stair uh, rather than have it up, uh, <coughs> pop up here, uh, compromising the circulation cross grain. Could we make it steeper? Could we turn it? We ultimately push it back to allow for this kind of clearing out of the center, uh, blowing out the exterior, emphasizing the space um, and its continuation uh, outside of itself with the seated program um, in, in the niches, if you will. At the back of the space is a, is a bookcase, which has a, a separate experiment about uh, porosity, because we couldn't blow out the face of the, um, on the front of the house. Um, the client wasn't, wasn't down with that. Um, but in, in, there is an attempt to have the space expand in this direction as well, vertically here, but also through a series of mirrors, uh, mirrored bookends that, that reflect, um, this is the panoramic, that, that reflect the void on the opposite end to suggest uh, continuity through, through that face as well. At the rear of the space, the emphasis was a vertical expansion, so this was the, the initial agenda, but we pulled back the, the um, skylights, large skylights, this way to align with the, uh, some of the plan geometry, and here again you see some of the mirrored bookends, uh, confusing what is surface, what is, uh, what is beyond, and what is behind. Uh, close up of that, and we'll see this, uh, this experiment uh, rears its head again in another project. This is a little clumsy, admittedly, uh, version of this uh, experiment. Looking back through at night, and again, uh, was interested in how the space doubles outside of itself uh, through reflection. Um, at, the same, at the same time, uh, a friend of mine, he's a songwriter, wrote this song that I felt like captured the angst that I, I felt uh, as an early practitioner, where the culture of excess had gotten to an absurd level and I felt like the, the departure from, uh, from type and history uh, was a bit too strong. 
uh, leading to these slick and sometimes um, useless architectures. Uh, and so there was a, a criticism um, to the agenda at the time, starting the practice 2009, right at the crash, uh, at the height of excess. Uh, and again, became interested in how um, the, the, the very familiar context could, could become um, a way to distort familiar typologies. Um, so the second pole is called La Casita, and it is a cultural center uh, for a Latino group in, in Syracuse, New York. And they wanted to create a space um, based on this typology of the La Casita, which was a phenomenon in the Bronx in the 70s, where there were a series of fires, and the, the locals built these small casitas, these, um, these little houses for community uh, engagement. The problem was they wanted that, but their site, their given site by the University of Syracuse, was inside of a warehouse. So it really had to free itself from the uh, exterior demands of, of the house, which was liberating for, for me. This was their, their sort of logo, the house. And um, it was liberating because it could operate um, under the premise of the frame rather than uh, of the skin. So um, again, erasing the face uh, and getting to a porous um, void type of logic, rather. So the, the house was distorted to fit inside in two ways. Uh, here you see the apex of the, um, the, the typical house, uh, but only the frame was built as a way to organize the program in the, in the space. They have a gallery component here, a performance component here, uh, a library, classroom, kitchen, storage, office. Uh, so this is the sort of fixed program uh, that doesn't change that much, but always connected to this flexible uh, zone through the, the frame of the house. And the only partitions are these incredibly simple curtains uh, that allow you to segment uh, uh, occasionally. Opposite the plan, um, the library has a sort of reciprocal uh, storage. So if it's the classroom for kids, there's a little mini gallery here. For the reading room, there's a library. And for the <coughs> performance space, there's storage for the curtain. So this is the space built. Uh, you can see the curtains in play, closing the, the, the classroom a little bit, uh, partitioning off the, uh, the event space in the back all um, trying to abuse the frame and allow for this continuity between the two uh, sides um, to close it off when necessary, but also a kind of porosity between all the parts from the kitchen. Um, okay. The third hole is also in Syracuse and um, is a writing studio for uh, uh, two poets. When I saw this context, this is the, the site and uh, the client's house is this one. I was reminded of this project by Johnny Petna, who is a, a professor of mine actually for a year in Italy, uh, along with Cristiano for all of the Francia of Super Studio. But I love this project um, because it, I, I see it as a gap um, or as a placeholder for type uh, rather than an object. And when I, you know, again, when I saw this context, it was, it was sort of perfect. And I, and I began to think, well, how can this project, which is ice for the, in, in Johnny's case, um, become something that is built as a whole and useful as a writing studio? And so the, the project uh, that completed is this. Uh, it's a three-level writing studio. On the base is the garage, and on the upper two levels is um, uh, writing and reading. Uh, the, the south facade looks like this. There is some reference also to um, Melnikoff's writing studio. Uh, his plan is, put this water down. His plan is the sort of Venn diagram of spaces. Um, I try this in section. And so you have um, the, the punctures of the, of the skin on the south are here. You can see a little bit the openings. Uh, and there's a bowl-shaped room and section for reading. So this is a soft space up here, uh, naturally lit from above. 
And this is the library and the writing. And there's actually a tub, the client wanted a tub. Uh, this doesn't work. So sorry, this is a video that is not working. Okay, well, it's a, it's a close up of this wall. Um, and it's this similar experience uh, to, the, to the attic project I showed with the bookcase where there's a series of openings and mirrors and books that operate um, evenly but also as a way to confuse surface. So here's the section um, drawn. This surface in the third level is subtly reflective to allow the space to continue and double outside of itself here. Um, this was a study model of the third floor. This is the third floor, naturally lit from above. The space ex expands off. This is a very soft, super thick, uh, like one inch thick foam with padding. So it's a, it's a giant bed for reading. Um, this is how you ascend from the second level to the third. Uh, this gap in the stair it gives you a kind of lens, uh, glimpse back down out through the second level to the tub. Um, and this is, this is the tub in the, in the second floor, um, intentionally continuous with the the horizontal datum that, that um, connects indoor to outdoor. And here you see the, the reflective uh, openings, uh, mirrors and openings. Sorry. Some tub studies, uh, tub, tub, uh, lined with radiant heat, so you can really stay in this tub for a long time. Actually, it's nice. I tried it. <laughs> <laughs> This is a lousy quality photo, but this is uh, before the door was installed, the entry from the house into the, into the space, uh, as you can see in the plan in a second. The space connects, uh, so here connects to the house through a very dark, it's like asphalt and tar covered, very dark, to separate it from the existing house, the new. Uh, so you enter this bridge from the stairwell here. So this is the garage level um, at grade. This is the bridge to the, to the house and to, uh, to the studio, where you see the door operate as a kind of, uh, it's a curved uh, polycarbonate <coughs> plastic um, on the third level. From the rear yard, uh, the, the skin of the building, go back to the face, sorry. Uh, the surface of the building is fabric. It's just wrapped with um, a silicone impregnated um, fiberglass sheet. Uh, can be held pretty tight uh, in tension uh, and allows for light to pass through it very easily. The client didn't want to be looking out at the street as they're riding and so there are really only, this is the only one that's open visually uh, with the exception of this on the third floor. But on the, on the second floor, this is the only opening to the street. Very little opening. So we go back. Um, this is a version, a much thinner version of what's used on the outside, but on the inside. So this part, the skin, is actually uh, operable here. Always hangs low, uh, but for privacy, um, is is uh, operable. And the bottom operates as a breezeway as well. So both sides open to allow the rear yard to continue um, to the face. A reflection of the window and the rear tree. Um, and, and so it, for me, it's, it does operate as a whole, uh, and as, a, as a gap in the sequence of uh, the suburban context. And I feel like the, a project like this, for me anyway, was possible because, uh, because of the context and this, the strange condition of the suburbs allows this uh, misfit uh, in the sequence to operate as a gap. Okay, uh, last hole. Uh, this one also in Syracuse. This one for Syracuse University. I was there for four years and uh, saw uh, four projects built, and there's a couple more in the mix now uh, up there, out there. Uh, this building is Huntington Hall, and it's at the, the border of Syracuse University's campus to the, to the city in some way. Uh, it was first a hospital, and now is used by the School of Education. Uh, the the initial the original entrance was here off the sidewalk, um, and it situates here on campus. This is this block. The red is this piece here, but has since expanded to a little bit larger building. The main access uh, to the campus from the city is this University Ave, and so it's very close to this access. But this is really the edge of campus, kind of here, and so it's right at that threshold. 
uh, in the 70s, this is the building zoomed in, so this is University Ave. Uh, they built this fence around the main entry. They changed the entry to the rear of the building, which made it very difficult to get to and confusing for the students, etc. And so the dean wanted to create a new um, entry and event space in addition to an auditorium. And we did this in two phases. Uh, it was a competition invited that we won. And our proposal was to connect the, this face um, through, by means of an opening, a hole, to the, act, to the, to the axis, uh, main axis of campus again, and to get rid of the fence and to create a large ramp uh, from, you'll see it's high as well, so the ramp was important um, for accessibility. And that's really the move. The first phase is, is literally a, a hole, an entry, and a ramp. And the second, we'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, was thinking a little bit of Sujimoto's uh, photographs of cinema as a blank uh, clearing, um, and also the erase the Kuning as a way to um, um, remember what what was, but uh, but but focus on um, the, the possibility of, uh, of something blank and, and open. And so this is, this is Bishop Huntington, uh, the original, um, I don't know, founder or whatever of the hospital and his nurses. But I saw this as, I don't know what those things are called, uh, the, you put your face in um, uh, as a kid. But I saw the building as, you know, as one of these things where the history is still there and the context is, uh, is still essential, but that it can always be changing, the inside is always changing based on the activities uh, uh, and the programming and the use at the time. So these are some early renderings. And then this is the finished uh, entry um, where it's a simple recessed glass plane uh, to allow visibility uh, uh, the structure. This is a very nervous moment for me, five stories, uh, with removing the bottom level. I remember uh, waiting for the phone call to make sure that everything was okay. Uh, this is the ramp back to University Ave. So it's a nice gradual slope up, uh, accessible for all. Uh, the drawings showing that this folds, for the face folds from this point. And because it's reflective, this is under construction, but this that glass plane, um, depending on the light quality, um, reflects the context or allows for visibility inside. There it is from above, connecting back to the main campus. This project has a second phase, which we're working on still. Um, the, the hole gets deeper <laughs> uh, and continues to the back. <coughs> this is the stair core in the building, and so this is very central. Um, this piece, which uh, in early phases was a kind of bull nose reflective exterior, is an auditorium so that the public pr can comment off the street and immediately to the, the event. <laughs> um, an early model of that auditorium. And some studies that we're doing now to accommodate, again, for um, accessibility primarily, where we're looking at uh, level portions and raked portions and how those can be combined. OK, so those are the four holes in um, Syracuse. And the next four projects, how are we doing on time? Um, are with uh, the collective practice. And so I collaborate again with, uh, with William O'Brien Jr. and Michael Kubo, and we, we join together as a way to intentionally maintain our own practices, but have uh, the collaborative outlet in, in addition uh, to supplement, but not uh, uh, threaten, maybe uh, in one sense. Um, and so we came together for this project, the Van Allen Institute. It was an open competition. And we saw it as a perfect opportunity to, um, to work on a project together. And so we submitted for the, the Van Allen's new ground floor space. Uh, for those of you who know the Van Allen, they um, owned the building here on 22nd Street in Manhattan. Uh, but they have previously been on the sixth floor and then the fourth floor. And David, the new director, uh, was very adamant about uh, if the Van Allen is, a, is about having architecture accessible to the public, that we need to be on the street. We need to be as accessible as possible. And so he wanted to move to the ground floor. 
the space previously was a bookstore by Low Tech and then kind of stopped midway through. The references for us for this project were many, but two I'll, I'll bring up. The first was uh, Nishi's Discovering Columbus. You, anyone familiar with, everyone familiar with this project? Beautiful project uh, of the statue of Columbus, uh, Columbus Circle in, in the city. Um, otherwise, completely inaccessible and unavailable, right? Um, and Nishi's brilliance was to create a scaffold, literally, so that people could come up to the statue and build a room around it um, uh, that was essentially a kind of living room environment. Um, the beauty of this project goes for me back to the, this relationship between the foreign and the familiar. Now you have something inaccessible and uh, in, in some ways foreign um, that by, by bracketing it properly with space, uh, you're able to make it more accessible and seemingly familiar. Uh, so I love this example, and in some ways we tried to do this uh, at the Van Allen. Uh, if you take the institute as being inaccessible, uh, Columbus. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the the second example was some uh, kind of phenomena, mostly in in Berlin, I think, that you can opt out of Google Street View, and th this is a strange play on publicness. Because for me, when you see something like this, you care less about what's going on here, and there's an intrigue about what is behind the screen. Uh, and so the, the screen comes into play uh, a lot for the Van Allen. We call it screenplay. And the proposal was a series of screens um, that operate together to create uh, a platform for scenarios, right? Um, the first screen really is this one here, and there, there is a familiar shape to the La Casita project. Most of it is circumstantial, but the, all of the fixed program sits behind the screen and can be opened accordingly as necessary to the flexible program. So that's our first screen. The other are these exterior screens. This one outside in the rear yard, semi-reflective and semi-porous, um, uh, transparent. Um, and in the front, also um, a screen which sits in the street so that when people walk through, because this is also partially reflective, they feel as though they're in the space. And so that, this was our Columbus, <laughs> this is our version of the Nishi, uh, which makes, makes um, visitors feel as though they're, they're in, inside without actually going inside. And a series of other screens. This was the display wall for content for their exhibitions. Uh, they could use, and the ceiling was uh, the, the screen of utility that provided all the, the function, projection, lights, uh, heat, etc. The plan, again, is kind of similar to the Van Allen in this kind of bow tie shape. This is the screen, uh, the, the main screen, with the flexible zones primarily here. Uh, here's the finished uh, space, looking back, early photos before some of the punch lists, but um, space from the rear, looking back out, you'll see this kind of daphnis screen, um, a series of coffers that we maybe borrow a little bit, emerge between Irwin and, let's say, uh, the, the Whitney coffers. We are interested in those two combining uh, to, to provide uh, this, this luminous ceiling. Uh, when this, when the, the vinyl screen is closed, uh, it, it provides a very, um, and this is the pinch point, very thin, um, very clear separation between, but also you can op open up the pockets as necessary to, and open it up almost entirely actually, uh, to allow for that relationship as you need. Um, so the, the screens again can be configured in many different ways. We, we provided a calendar for the Van Allen, uh, a, a scenario uh, that, they're, that they could play with. Um, and depending on how the screens were deployed, you could have a dinner party in the space. Um, clear shot, actually, this is the dinner party that we opened with, which we we're happy to look to. It's very similar to the, to the rendering. Um, it's a kind of weird thing, actually, when you, do, when you do this and then you get, I don't know, it's a very weird feeling. Um, or um, a kind of mixed media show um, by pulling the screens, you can sort of partition uh, the space off. Uh, you have a large show on the content wall, but um, smaller versions of that. 
one of the first exhibitions using that entire display wall um, was about gentrification, and so that's showing the space in use. Um, a cocktail party with all, if none of the screens are deployed, and here's the opening. Um, and uh, many other scenarios, because they also use this space as their offices. Uh, you can see office, I don't have any images of that here, but um, they work back here um, most of the time. Or a lecture scenario, which the rendering is this. Actually, this was um, just this Friday <coughs> taken by um, Michael Kubo, uh, his book launch for Heroic, which uh, I believe there's also a book opening tonight if anyone is curious about um, uh, Michael Kubo's uh, effort on that front. And so this is a, a full house at the, at the new Van Allen. And this, this is the, uh, it hasn't happened yet. I'm still trying to twist David's arm. Uh, not, it might not. It did get cut initially. Uh, but this is the, the street seat, the screen that sits in front of the Van Allen. The other reason for this uh, solution was because the, this is a landmark facade. So we really couldn't do anything with this well, behind here, but with that. And so it was one way to get a new face. Um, <coughs> this is also a trailer. Uh, in a, in, has doors and can be attached to a truck or whatever and move through the city uh, for pop-up events, the way for the institution to, to leave itself a bit. Uh, three more projects. Um, we, after the Van Allen, had the opportunity to uh, enter for the PS1 MoMA competition um, that happens yearly. And our proposal was to um, objectify the space of the courtyard, but recognizing that, because this is such an iconic figure, we loved it because it was a space above more so than an object. Rather than put an object in the courtyard, we wanted to make the courtyard the object. Uh, at the same time, we struggled a lot with this wall, which separates the two, the, the institution from the public. And so, most of what we do with this project is an attempt to both celebrate the courtyard um, outside of itself. So the inside um, surface is, again, mirror and reflective. We build a mound. There's a grotto underneath, we propose, uh, so that users can actually get up and over the wall. Uh, the courtyard doubles um, through the reflectivity. And this um, drooping sack of pixelated mirror fragments also operates as a kind of periscopic relationship over the wall so that people outside can get a sense of what's happening inside in, in the reverse. Some sections. This is the, the big giant sack drooping down uh, and the mound to get over the wall. A kind of instant moment um, where in the, the reflective tiles of the sack erode so that there is an escape of context uh, in the center when the space is, space is free and clear of any uh, vertical interruptions as much as possible for the largest possible gatherings. And at night, because this is reflective, operates as a kind of uh, strobe light for the party uh, in the summer. But uh, David Benjamin won with his mushroom towers. <laughs> so we didn't get it. Um, this is how it looks in the day outside. You can see the somebody trying to get outside of the institution. Uh, okay, two more projects. This one very brief, and the last one you know, probably even quicker. This project was a proposal for the Peace Corps, a uh, commemorative work. They didn't want to call it a memorial. Uh, in Washington, D.C., that we got honorable mention for, so close, but not close enough. Uh, they're working on the final round now, the final three. Um, always hurts to get fourth place. Um, this <laughs> this site is a, it's a fairly small. Um, we'll go back to the relationship to the capital. So here's the capital, and there's the site. Um, this little island in the context was for us an opportunity to create a fictitious geography. Uh, I mean, how do you represent the agenda of the Peace Corps? Uh, right, so there is a there are two grids here. Actually, one starting from this side, moving this way, and one from this side, moving that way. The base. There is a single line starting here that wraps all like this, kind of crazy, and ends up here. This is an undulating glass wall 
and it does have a few shortcuts uh, that you can move through these otherwise trapped zones. So yeah, here you get a close-up of this wall, but you, you get, and you can see the shift in the grids when they meet this wall. So there is this boundary condition between two sides, whatever they might be, and the complexity of the border is enough to suggest, um, uh, we'll go back to the section, um, the need for transparency with, with re in relationships about border are in play here in this project. Uh, so it's, it's complex enough that all these, uh, the, the geography, once it's extruded, um, creates a space and a zone for, for meandering, uh, but also the, the transparency suggests how to get relationship between the sides. Uh, the, the bowl overhead is a, is a cut, it's a void, it's the reverse, actually, of the, of the PS1 proposal. Just out of reach is this kind of space uh, that, that um, uh, collects them all together, it collects, collects this mess together, even though it's not uh, accessible. So it's, um, yeah, peace. Uh, yeah, and this is it at night. You can see the trace, the uh, line, um, and the bowl, uh, but this is the zone of occupation here. Okay, last project. This one we won, <laughs> good. Uh, <laughs> but, but very small and also very, very difficult in a, in a weird way. So this is for, uh, actually it's not yet public, so don't say it, but they're announcing, I think, today or tomorrow. Um, so if they change their mind, then I'll put my foot in my mouth. But uh, this project happens also yearly. I think it's in its eighth year, and it's for Times Square. And it is uh, the Valentine, uh, right, for the city. Uh, so it's tough because the mandate is you have to use the heart. Uh, it's tough. So, um, and so this is one of this is one of the proposals, and um, and you have to have it be interactive. Those are the two demands. Uh, so we didn't want to have an object. Uh, we wanted to create a space, and so we created this, this room. We call it the heart of hearts. A series of chambers. Uh, actually, we were calling kissing booths a room on the inside, and this kind of effect on the exterior ring. Uh, that can, and we're also uh, going through now, planning a series of events in Times Square that happen in the room that people can uh, become curious about or participate in. Um, one of them is a, a way, this will operate as a chapel, actually, on Valentine's Day they do a vow renewal and, uh, this will, and proposals, so that, that will happen here in this uh, sort of chapel. Uh, if you will, or a romantic moment at 3 a.m. when no one's in Times Square. Uh, so this is inside one of the kissing booths. You see the tops of the, the heart there. Um, this is also inside one of the kissing booths, and because the, these are reflective, gold reflective hearts, because there, there is an attempt to uh, have this ring be defined st strictly by the context of the city, so they're, they're reflective. Inside is this kind of infinite regression uh, of kissers, um, and the the project is high uh, that you can move through uh, the archway of a series of hearts that connect as a ring. So there's some uh, studies. Is it supposed to spin? No. Anyway, uh, the surfaces are reflective, and you can you can pass through. We're studying now how to maybe increase the amount so that we lose the heart even more, uh, but it's, it becomes a ring, um, a crenulated ring that you can um, uh, do whatever whatever you want in. This is a wedding party photo shoot. Okay, that's it for me, thank you. Okay. Because uh, we have Christina, John, and Ricardo. Uh, can you go there, please? And, and can we switch on the lights? And we have still some minutes. Thank you for the presentation. So, <clears throat> Christina is teaching this year first core here. Uh, Ricardo is teaching option studio and coming from Lisbon. And John May is teaching third core. So uh, they, they will make a kind of response, and then we will open to a bit of discussion. Mark, uh, is there? So, so you you have to go there too. <laughs> Mark Young and Sereno is the, the the student in the table. Ah, okay. <laughs> so make him suffer. Oh boy. <laughs> Okay, I don't know. Yes. Um, 
John, thanks. Um, I think uh, there'll probably be other questions regarding the specific content of the work, maybe from the audience, but what I wanted to have you talk about more, um, because the time is so limited, uh, is how, you mentioned po post fordism in the beginning, right? So obviously that's changed practice in a lot of ways. It's changed it through digital fabrication and all these kinds of things. But one of the ways it's also changed practice is to just liquefy a whole series of things that used to seem stable and solid. Two, two things in particular that I'm thinking of, that is practice and the academy, mm -hmm. right? So two, two places that used to seem like fairly stable places for, for people like us as we were coming up through the ranks, right? That we could maybe uh, uh, sink our feet into and that would provide some, something stable amidst uh, all of the other fluctuations when you're trying to build a practice. And it seems to me those are, in many ways, those are both, uh, like I said, liquefied by post-Fordism. Shorter, shorter job tenurial rates, low unionization, et cetera, et cetera. All of the, the uh, typical storyline that we know. Um, and so I think we've all had to react post-2008 in different ways. And so I think uh, what might be interesting would be to hear you talk about uh, what, what the model of practice is, because that seems mundane on some levels, but it's, it's actually impossible to produce any work without um, a very intelligent model of practice. And so uh, what I think is interesting about what you've done is, is uh, if, I look at, if I look at CLOCK, at Collective LOK, you all three had personalities and projects prior to forming that. And that makes it seem like, I mean, it seems from the outside, from anybody who hasn't tried it, that collaboration is purely beneficial and relatively easy and all of these things. And maybe it is even up and, up and through the competition stage. But I guess I'd like to hear you talk about after you win the competition. <laughs> because um, the, it seems to me the collaboration becomes very difficult uh, the moment the stakes are raised. Um, and I've seen that in other, in other attempted collaborations. And so maybe talk about how you guys, how you are able to balance your individuality, how that maybe provides you some temporary stability amidst things that are no longer stable, and then how that, how that plays out as a process throughout the course of a, a project all the way through to completion like the Van Allen. Right. No, really good question and, and definitely like always present on the mind uh, in, in the last, you know, five, six years as as you struggle to practice, right? Um, and and I think um, one of the way what I like about it is we do maintain our own individual practices, but the collaboration. And yes, you're right. There's a there's a space for the competition, which uh, has low stakes in terms of commitment uh, and, and working through a project in reality. Come up with an idea, <laughs> some renderings, cool drawings, send it off, and hope for the best. That is that works really well in a collaborative environment. So in the case of the Van Allen, uh, when it became real, uh, we had to treat it like, um, you know, like any other job. And who is who is going to be the one running the project, et cetera? And so the in that case, because it was in New York, the project went through my my office, um, but under the direction of the the three of us always. But the production aspect of it uh, came under the umbrella of my office. Mm -hmm. um, just, just as I mean, a lot of reasons. I had the license. I was in New York. Um, and are so, you guys a legal entity? <laughs> we are not a legal entity. The, the collective is not a legal mm -hmm. entity. So should and I'm actually working on a project with Liam, yes. which is legally his but collaboratively ours in mm -hmm. some way, mostly his. That's not shown here. Uh, so currently, it's not an entity uh, legally, and so we would then operate legally in our, with our own. That's that's how it's. I mean, it's fairly new. It's a two or three years in, um, and no, but surely you have those conversations absolutely. relatively early on. Absolutely, and so in that case, because you know we got lucky with the first one. Like, yeah. Oh, now what? Um, and so that's how we managed it with the insurance and the license came through my office. Uh, hopefully, there are more, and you know, we see what happens then. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a great question and uh, a kind of ongoing concern, I think, for most young practitioners. Yeah, um, yeah I think it's yeah. extremely, uh, yeah. it's, a, it's, it's all, model, <laughs> yeah, it's a model of practice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It doesn't change, though. Yeah. It, it just seems like a model of practice that is increasingly likely to replace the old standard partnership. Well, so yeah, and, and you know, I tried partnership, actually, the first three years of my practice was a partnership, and it, and it was, had its good moments, but ultimately didn't work. And, and so this is the model that I'm now uh, very excited about because uh, there is, uh, especially when you're small, there's a vulnerability to the, the projects and 
uh, and how you build up your own practice, right? So I love the fact that uh, I can now do both, and, and it, it, it feels really, really good, yeah. So. Yeah, so I um, somehow related to what it means to uh, practice today and uh, this new model that you have found, but you also uh, were talking before about um, uh, how you are seeing the things that are happening uh, today in terms of like a critique to the excess, no? Uh, you were saying that um, uh, we use the tools and uh, we manipulate that because we can and how you can be critical to that uh, by looking back uh, and uh, being influenced uh, by what precedes us. You were talking about a distortion of typologies um, and you were talking about uh, that specifically uh, through uh, just before uh, the project of La Casita, you were talking about this distortion of typologies, but I, I see that there is like a lot of um, uh, relationships uh, with what uh, precedes you in your projects, in most of them. Not maybe because all of them are um, interventions in something that is already there. Mm -hmm. So somehow, uh, like you, you, your projects are like. Very, very tightly constrained, either because it's through a typology that you want to distort or because there's something else there that you then take and manipulate and then you, you generate something new. So in some, how I, I see like a great level of innovation uh, in the project, but innovation as the transformation, like innovation uh, through it in its definition, no? like the transformation of what exists. And I was wondering, if you can elaborate a little bit more on what it means for you to work with what exists, being it something that is already there where you are intervening, or uh, which typologies uh, mm -hmm. do you use? Um, uh, if, if it's something that, that you do more systematically. So that's one question, and I, I have another one, I don't know. <laughs> that I, try I, I that one first. I want to hear that. Uh, maybe I'll throw both of them. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, okay, so the other uh, has has to do with something that you, so the, the first one uh, relates to something that you specifically talked about. Uh, this you didn't mention, but I actually saw in all of your, pro in many of your projects, a very deliberate way uh, of using the figure. Uh, like in the PS1, for example, is the triangle, in the, in, in the sphere, in the uh, uh, poet uh, house, or the, like all of them, or in, in the PS1 is like this, uh, sorry, the Van Allen is this double cone in the plan. And uh, I also, I, I'm intrigued if this is something, uh, the figure is something that you use uh, in a, a yeah, as a tool uh, to organize your projects, or this is something that come, comes afterwards, like how, uh, it's like kind of something that you overimpose. It's almost related to the other question, no? like what exists yeah. there versus what you impose. Yeah, I think uh, what I like about both questions is the, and the common denominator for me for those two questions is that there is a root, uh, and one happens to be context or typological baggage that I love uh, as a constraint, um, and the other, uh, is is uh, a geometric order or figure or um, a set of rules that also work to uh, synthesize and, con and and constrain, right? And, and, and in both cases, the need to depart from only a little. If the original is not there, I feel it gets too messy too quick. Uh, if there is no reliance on typology um, and, and, and the context. Uh, it, it becomes increasingly difficult to to uh, to steer the project. So I love those constraints and need those to distort the types uh, to, to to get a little bit outside of sphere or a little bit outside of uh, of house, right? Whatever. And I hope that I hope that clarifies. But I I think that those those um, the context both I see as contextual in some way baggage. Uh, uh, sometimes are not relied on enough, and as I feel like, and I, I love to use those things in the work. So, 
No, um, well, first of all, I want to say that I enjoyed very much the presentation. Closer to the microphone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <coughs> no, congratulations for all the presentation. I think it was beautiful and very interesting projects. Uh, and actually, there are two or three issues that I think were very, very important and are very important these days to share with students. Uh, one, of course, was already mentioned this concept of because we can, we should not do. Mm. As we can do everything, it's time to be very sensitive and to choose <laughs> which one we should do. Exactly. Right. <laughs> so that, I think that is a very sensitive um, issue. And uh, and uh, and uh, you you have chosen this idea of the whole the whole uh, the whole to 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 present the four projects. Although I think this concept, in a way, goes and continues in the other project because mm -hmm. in somehow it's a bit of this um, this will to clear to to clarify the space and to to organize the program in a way that uh, you really enjoy uh, to find out uh, a, a nice and qualified uh, void where you can have multiple uses and eventually with the intensive intense uh, geometry that is not monotonous or is very much dynamic and I think that you can, we feel it very, very often in, in most of the projects. So, um, for one side, it has a lot to do with the, the manipulation of the program, in, uh, putting aside very all, all the, 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 the parts of the program that can be organized in a way that you have this central um, piece, uh, which you see in most of the the project and I think it's it's very powerful in a way. But another thing that I think it's very nice to share is this clear uh, strategic uh, way of uh, of doing a project, mainly with one idea. So this is uh, is quite it's almost a conceptual attitude towards the the project. So for one side you have a, a clear conceptual attitude. For another side you pay attention to program and site. So maybe, uh, how, how does this whole thing come together? And, uh, <laughs> that's <the> work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the that's, uh, design, right? That's, yeah. that, that's how they come together, right? I suppose, but um, I don't know what the question is really, but... Um, it is not, uh, <laughs> it's more of a sharing... Uh, yeah. yeah. Have Thanks. you ever had to abandon a concept? <laughs> What's that? Have you ever had, had, had to abandon a concept? Uh, yeah, I think a lot of times in early phases there's uh, sort of competing concepts, right? And then you try and synthesize according to one, you try another, and you find, yeah, I think there's uh, early competition for these things to be in the contextual uh, baggage, typological baggage, um, and, and a kind of conceptual agenda, right? Uh, and, and until you find that synthetic starting point, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Um, also relating to kind of geometry of the figure, as it was stated in the second question, um, you kind of mentioned that the geometric order um, or these rules that are established kind of constrain. Um, but in reading the project, it seems, or in, in, in the drawings, um, it seems that it's kind of that figure that actually kind of interjects this temporal narrative into most of the most of the drawings. I was just wondering if you could speak maybe a little bit to that. Uh, the temporal narrative really has to do a lot with use, right? And uh, that as architects we can't control the use, but you can set up uh, a figure uh, and a series of um, a suggested ways of, of using that. And so, uh, especially with the collective work, we're playing a lot more with scenario diagrams or scenario drawings, the calendar plan, or you see in the in, in the heart, you know, these kinds of things that take place. It's it's a way to also test uh, what's possible and the effects that you that you've produced. And so, very very interested in how. Um, you can test the variable uses against what you, yeah, that's a huge part of it. And, uh, we still have a, thank you, thank you everyone. I mean, we still have a, a, a couple of minutes if, if uh, every one of you want to make a comment or critique him. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you, John, for that presentation. Um, I'm really interested in the way that you frame it in terms of holes and the way that you set the conversation as, as a reaction to the gratuity 
or the totality maybe of certain architectural practices and objects, um, especially because we could think of these as holes in a different way, that is holes with a W. Uh, and that this play between the total or the whole and your kind of whole or the absence um, leaves us with a stranded W. Uh, you ended with an exclamation mark, but I think this W is a question mark, who, what, where. Uh, and in the context of the temporal narrative that you give to the project, I'm reminded of a certain young lady who follows a rabbit into a hole, uh, wondering whether she'll need her untimely demise. And I wonder if you can clarify for us what is the question uh, that we should be asking as Alice falls down the hole. <laughs> What's the question at stake in the difference between the hole and, and the total? Oh, that's good. That's good. I like the question a lot. Uh, I, I think. Go to the microphone, please. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that the. I, I thought about also that these, the, rather than holes, are question. Each project is is a question, and I, I think of the the difference between an archi architecture as a solution and architecture as a question is something that we've talked in studio a lot about, and so I. I feel like uh, I, I prefer the face to me is the whole um, the, the the whole without W is the question mm -hmm. and I and I am leaning more and more towards trying to produce architecture that, that raises questions rather than uh, the answer. Mm -hmm. the, the answer. And you say you sit in that type of yeah, architecture yeah. or whatever. And you say, yeah. for instance, the Seagram is is like giving an answer the the Fordist approach. Uh, not the not the initial Seagram. No. Sure, but not the, the operated Seagram that uh, you showed. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? One, two, three, three, two, one. But I, I want to just throw saying that uh, uh, I, I I I think mean, it's, it's it's a pity, by the way, that that you have made this lecture after. We have published the 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 on design techniques monograph in May last year because I think it's a it's a great lesson on design techniques. A very very consistent uh, from the, this <coughs> first um, statement on uh, because we can and the discussion on what what can we do with this and 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 with the persistencies of, of techniques and and also the variations on in terms of form in terms of matter. I mean I think fabrics are very important also. So there is there is a kind of other thing than just geometry, and also the, in terms of the movement of people. I think that many of the projects, this one in particular, but others are, are really uh, working on flows and, and, and taking m much of their, let's say, energy or form from, from, from that. No? So I think it's, it's, it's an amazing, interesting uh, proposal, this idea of working just with holes in, in, in terms of, of how, how I understand this, this proposal in terms of opportunistic uh, approaches. No? So, where we have to detect in, in which moment what can be done and, and for, for whom. And, and I think this is a great lesson. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.